seminar, so glad that you're here. I am really excited today to introduce, as most of you probably know, Steve Vavris, who is a senior scientist at CCR, assistant director at CCR, and can we still say relatively newly minted? Sure. Uh, relatively newly minted um, uh, uh, state climatologist. And we were just talking about this. I think this is a pretty nice little logo, so I'd love to see if, we can, if you can keep that in. Um, going forward. So thanks for being here Steve and for giving us some updates on, on the, the climatology office and some initiatives going forward. Thanks Paul. Yeah. Well thank you for all for coming today and um, to answer this question, what's new in the Wisconsin State Climatology Office? And the answer is a lot is new and as I'll get into and um, without further ado let me give a little bit of background here. So it was exactly a year ago, maybe to this day, when we found out some unexpected news from Steve Ackerman in the Vice Chancellor's office that we were going to be getting a very nice and unexpected gift. Um, uh, Senator Baldwin arranged for uh, funds to be funneled to UW-Madison to form a Rural Partnerships Institute. And the goal of that is to support Wisconsin's rural communities. And this Rural Partnerships Institute consists of three pillars, one of them being the State Climatology Office and the Nelson Institute, uh, the other in HALS, the Mesonet, which I'll talk about, the statewide network of weather stations, and then CALS and Division of Extension combining on a set of rural community research and outreach activities. So uh, this is brand new, uh, Rural Partnerships Institute, a uh, four-year grant, so it is important to realize it's, it's not forever. And there's a lot of good things that came about. So we, we applied for this in what, November, lickety split. In December it was approved, and in January we hit the ground running. So it all happened really, really quickly. A lot of pluses. The biggest, from my point of view, the State Climatology Office finally has resources after more than 20 years of volunteer operations. And because it's grant funded. One advantage is that we're not beholden to being, say, in a state agency where we have to consider the, the politics of what we do. Um, another is that it encourages research. This is intended as both service and outreach, but also largely research. And then, really nice for the SCO's perspective, is that as part of the funding, this Wisconsin Mesonet formed and we're natural allies. Um, to have to SEO to work with the mezzanine very closely. However, nothing's perfect, no such thing as a free lunch, and some of the negatives about this, the biggest being it's a four-year grant lifetime, whereas other state climate offices, sometimes it's already uh, you know, hard-coded in their, their statute um, or in some other way uh, has a long, uh, unlimited lifetime, but this does not. Most staff, including myself, are only supported part-time. We couldn't ask for the moon, even though we did get what seemed like the moon at the time, considering starting from zero. And despite its name, it's actually not state-funded. The State Climatology Office, the only state part of it is the state support of in-kind office space on the 13th floor. <laughs> we need to develop, therefore, some sort of sustainable funding stream and the logical place is the state, as most state climate offices are funded. But wanting money from the state to support an SEO is nothing new. And to show you how not new it is, I'm going to show you some history. This is a letter that uh, UW alum John, St John Stremicus, an AOS alum, unearthed somehow <laughs> last year. And it is a letter that increased Lapham, a familiar name on this campus, a naturalist and prolific writer, wrote to then Chancellor John Lathrop back in 1851. <laughs> Lapham was strongly urging Lathrop to uh, institute a system of meteorological observations throughout the state to accurately show the climate of Wisconsin. And interestingly, there's a background here, this is kind of funny. Uh, the results obtained by correct and continuous observations would set at risk many of the misrepresentations and slanders <laughs> now uttered daily in New York by hired agents uh, of the climate and agricultural capacities of our highly favored state. So Michael, that's your responsibility as a New Yorker. Uh, slanders. So we had to set the record straight. And then uh, later, uh, uh, 
increased lap of it, closes by saying it would be much advantage to Wisconsin to have these observations made and published in connection with the others so as to show at once our exact position among other states in regard to climate. This is way back in the early 1850s. Unfortunately, uh, Lathrop did not institute a, uh, a state climatology office at the time, although there is a long history of meteorological observations on campus and in the state. Um, but it took a long time and a lot of evolution uh, before we get to where we are today. And this is a very brief history of the State Climatology Office. If you want to know the full history, talk to Ed Hopkins. He knows it all. <laughs> Prior to, eight, or to 1953, most of Wisconsin's climate records were managed by the U U.S. Weather Bureau, now the National Weather Service, in their Madison office. And there was a lot of overlap between the Madison office and the UW campus. In the mid-1950s, uh, for reasons I, I, I don't know, uh, the federal government created a multi-state program of state climatologists or state climate offices. So the federal government supported these, and Wisconsin's first state climatologist uh, began in 1953. And uh, this federal program lasted for about 20 years, but during the hard times in the 1970s, the federal support dried up. And so the, what happened was no more federal support for each state climate office, but each state had the option to continue their existing offices, but it had to come out of their pocket. And Wisconsin, fortunately, decided to take advantage of this and did fund the office for about 25 years and did it through this Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey, which is off campus. And so it, it Little, to me, it strikes me as a little bit of an odd location administratively to put the SCO, uh, but that's where it functioned for, for a couple, two and a half decades. But by the late 1990s, around 2000, the, S, the, the Geological Survey decided to use those funds for different purposes, and that left the SCO kind of high and dry. And uh, at that time, it became a, a volunteer operation within AOS, so in-kind support for, through AOS, including Pete here, um, and it was led by John Young, Ed Hopkins, and Lyle Anderson, and I'll get to them more in a moment. And then, uh, where we are today, after this long period uh, without any funding, we received this grant, and now uh, we began through this Rural Partnerships Institute. So this is a brief history of where we've been, um, and the big news here for today's talk is um, starting here in, in 2023. I want to really recognize uh, our longtime SCO staff. So without them, the office would not have been able to hit the ground running. It would have been more of a hitting a, from a dead start this year. Um, first of all, John Young, uh, emeritus professor in AOS, was the longtime hey, director. Hey, Steve. Yep. There he is. All right, John. There you are. Thank you. And have a seat. You should uh, have your choice of seats as I'm recognizing you. And then uh, Ed Hopkins has, uh, has been a long time, uh, the long time assistant state climatologist, and he's continued um, uh, through part time funding on this grant. And um, uh, he's a very familiar face to you, I'm sure, just like John is. And then Lyle Anderson, our office manager, who even predates John and Ed in the office. He's been doing this since the 1980s. But now, as of the beginning of this year, we've been able to fill out the staff some more. So I started on January 1st uh, through funding by the Nelson Institute. Paul Robbins, the dean, uh, provided some funding to support communications in the office, and so we were able to hire Dia Larson Converse as our communications director on a part-time basis. But now we still have some slots to fill. Uh, a full-time assistant state climatologist. We just, the, the closing for that job application was last night at midnight, so we have uh, apparently about 27 applicants will be reviewing uh, applicants and hopefully get a person full-time in that position by January 1st. We have two student positions, a graduate student, we have an RA position for a two-year graduate student, uh, probably next fall would be the logical time to bring them in, and then uh, an undergraduate student or students, we have money uh, for undergraduate interns as hourlies, 
And so this, this is great. I mean, we now have the ability to really fill out this matrix and uh, provide training, provide you know, lots of uh, services that we could, couldn't provide before um, when this was done on not even a shoestring budget. Okay, so that's where, uh, where things stand in the big picture. And for me, uh, since this started, it's, it's been frenetic, okay? So I knew it would be this way. It's a little bit like starting a business. Uh, and uh, so no surprise, but definitely lots of multiple priorities and urgencies and things. Uh, fortunately, it hasn't been as weird as the film, if you've seen the film, but uh, definitely the title is apt. And why is it apt? Well, we've got a lot of things cooking right now. Um, the, the newest being we've just revamped the website, uh, thanks to support from the Nelson Institute Strategic Communications Office. Uh, we have a brand new website. It's much more modernized. Um, hopefully it's, it'll take some of the load off of Ed, who's been maintaining it for all these years. Um, so please check it out. I'll give you a, a preview here later in the talk. We're working on improving the branding. There's a mention of the logo. Um, uh, we are the only state that has SCO in its name, so we got to take advantage of that, being Wisconsin. Um, a mission statement as well. It hasn't been finalized, so I give that a, a partial check, faint here. Expanding staff, if I, as I mentioned. Something that's been really nice and I think hopefully useful is we're creating these monthly and seasonal climate summaries. So the middle of each month, work with Ed, putting together a summary of the past month, temperature conditions, precipitation conditions, and so on. It's very readable. It's, it's intended for a broad audience, so check that out on our website. To come is more uh, applied research and decision support tools when we have the added support of a full-time assistant. Lots of networking with other state climate offices around the country and related service organizations. Working um, on the, supporting the U.S. Drought Monitor with their weekly updates, as well as the Volunteer Coco Ross Precipitation Observer Network. Talk about that more in a bit. Uh, we have money in the budget to host a climate summit to gather stakeholder input about what people would like the office to be. That's still in the works. Started a Twitter account and hopefully expand to things like Instagram and YouTube to increase our social media presence. Interfacing with the Wisconsin Mesonet, talk more later, and then when time permits, uh, we have uh, a plan to form an advisory board called the Climate Partners Team to help uh, have stakeholders provide input on the direction of the office. So that's what's been happening so far in 2023, but now let me take a step back and just ask a question that I've been asked, uh, why does Wisconsin or any state need a state climatology office? Isn't all the information you need online anyway? Why does anybody need to fund an office? Well, I would say there's lots of reasons. One is the fact that the climate is changing, and it's changing dramatically, and it's having societal impacts. Uh, this is a figure that I've taken from uh, wiki work uh, showing the temperature trends in Wisconsin since uh, rapids began in 1895 by decade. Uh, this shows the annual mean temperature, and you can see that the last two decades were the warmest on record. And the real big spike here in the 20-teens when it came to precipitation, uh, this easily broke the statewide precipitation record for uh, Wisconsin, and of course that came with a lot of flooding events as well. So increases in means, in heat and moisture, as well as increases in certain types of extremes. So that alone is a reason why there's a lot more attention being paid to uh, places like climate offices. That heating has big impacts on the ground or on the water. Uh, as you know, we've got this benefit of Lake Mendota, the most studied lake in the world, they say. And one of the things, the important records the office keeps, thanks to Ed, is a 170 year now record of lake ice conditions. And this is one that a lot of you are familiar with already. But this is a gold mine if you're a climatologist. I mean, it, by inference, it shows dramatically how our climate has warmed around Wisconsin over the years. Uh, starting in, in the early 1850s, what's remarkable is that it's a continuous record. It's very rarely do you see long records that are continuous like this. And thanks to Ed's diligence, we maintain the same methods of observations 
that we think took place back in the early 1850s. So we don't have an SCO drone going out over Lake Mendota. Uh, that would be more accurate, but it would make the records incompatible with the early days. And so it's the old-fashioned binoculars going around the lake and making a judgment. But you can see that in the early part of the record here, the duration of ice cover in those winters was a lot more than it is today. And so despite the year-to-year -year variability, an unmistakable warming trend with time. And so maintaining this record is really important. Uh, we need to continue that in the office. Something else that's gotten a lot of our attention in the office this year is this weird weather whiplash we've had uh, across the, every month of the year. Uh, the state started with its wettest January through April on record. Notice February was more than double the normal precipitation statewide. And then the faucet shut off, and we had the fourth driest May through August on record. Every month below normal. <coughs> in May and June, less than half of normal rainfall. So it's just an incredible whipsaw between really wet and then really, really dry. September's just come in a hair below normal, so we continue that dry spell. That weather whiplash, in this case hydrological whiplash, has met societal impacts on things like lake levels and the Great Lakes. Uh, if you've been paying attention to some of the news over the past decade, you've probably been following this. Lake Michigan, for example, um, has long-term records lasting more than a century. Right after the 2012 drought, the water levels on Lake Michigan were as low as any time on record. And then within a decade, uh, we reached the high point in 2020, as high as any other year on record. And that's, there's no other period like that during that big a change um, in less than a decade. And one of the consequences of that was the combination of high lake levels in 2020 and the warmth, which meant little lake ice. Um, there was a big January storm of that year, and it resulted in huge lakeshore flooding, damage, you see the big waves, icing, infrastructure damage, and three counties, um, I think, were, well, states of emergency, if not disaster areas for uh, funding relief. So it's another example of how the climate is relevant for us. And then, uh, as I said, we've been having this really, really dry spell this summer, but it's actually reached historic drought uh, earlier in the year, even just last month. Uh, the U.S. Drought Monitor that maintains records since 2000 updates these maps every week. And uh, we can then compare every week during that 20-some years and see how we rank this year compared to other big drought years like 2012. And it turned out that if you take the spatial average of drought conditions for these different drought categories, we were the most um, of any drought on record back to 2000. One of the things the office does is we provide expert assessment to the U.S. Drought Monitor authors. Um, so we don't create the map for Wisconsin. The maps are created uh, at University of Nebraska, but there's input given by folks at the National Weather Service, the state climate offices, and based on precipitation amounts and on-the-ground reports and um, other factors, we help to provide our assessment that, you know, where should this boundary be for extreme drought versus severe drought. And that matters because the counties that are in certain drought categories for long enough uh, are eligible for federal drought relief. So exactly where the boundary goes uh, makes a big difference for farmers in that particular county. They either win out or they lose out. Oh, and uh, one other thing that we've been doing in terms of drought is that there's an ad hoc statewide drought task force that's been formed this year for the Wisconsin Emergency Management. Uh, the last time that happened was the drought of 2012, and uh, we've been providing climate briefings to that group. That's a group of statewide agency representatives and National Weather Service representatives, so that's been a good way for the SCO to get on the map on, on a statewide basis, but uh, it's unfortunate that it took a, a major drought to do that. Okay, so besides that more formal role that I just described, the SCO also functions kind of like a short order cook when it comes to weather and climate questions. So as, as Ed can attest to, and I'm sure John too, 
we get all sorts of questions about weather and climate. And here's just a few. Some of them are logical, some of them are a little funny. Um, we got a lot about climate change affecting things like the Berka binder. Got a lot of those back in January and February. Lots of insurance representatives wondering about climate data for their claims. So a lot of uh, snow and rain in particular. Sometimes you get a person doing a story on like, in this case, the, the Bayfield flash flood and they want upper air data. Uh, not easy to find. On an agricultural um, basis, we get queries about things like potato farming and wine growing and how climate change is affecting those. Basic things. Is there a trend in thunderstorms across Wisconsin? Actually surprisingly hard to answer. Lots of, and lots already and more to come about how El Nino will affect our winter weather. And then the strangest one that I've seen this year, uh, somebody from the uh, energy industry saying that, boy, there's been a lot more of these squirrel-induced transformer blow-ups is, is the drought or heat to blame. I said, well, I'm going to outsource that one. <laughs> no idea how weather affects drought behavior or squirrel behavior. Question about the Richmond, tor New Richmond tornado in 1899. Another one similar to this Bayfield question. Early September, the WKOW meteorologist wanted to know what's the hottest football game ever played at Camp Randall. We didn't quite make it, but we were close this year in the early 90s. And then another odd one, uh, butterfly migration. Apparently this year had a big influx of a certain type of butterfly from out west, and this butterfly expert was wondering if it was because of odd wind patterns. And then finally, a really apt one for this year, how does wildfire smoke affect crops? So this gives you an idea of the sorts of questions we get by phone or by email. Uh, you really never know what's coming, and either we try to answer them ourselves, Ed does the, most of these, he does a, doctor data, a lot of experience handling these things, but sometimes we outsource them to other experts around. Okay, so big picture. Um, what is our mission and what is our vision for the State Climatology Office? So now with these new resources of revitalized office, we can kind of decide for ourselves if we want to go in a, in a different direction. So a working mission statement for now is that the office should provide climate services that help Wisconsinites use weather and climate information most effectively. And this term, climate services, I hear all the time, or at least I, I started to hear all the time when I took this position as director, and I couldn't really define it. And I thought, well, that's a problem because everybody's talking about it and that the office provides these services, but I didn't really have a definition myself. So I had to think long and hard about it. And finally, I came up with my perception of what climate services should be for this office. And it's embodied by this guy. A three-eyed monster is my, uh, my metaphor for climate services. And the reason is that each eye represents an element of these climate services. So one eye that the office should provide is information. Uh, and specifically reliable weather and climate information. So one of the things that people will say is, you don't need a climate office, all this information on weather and climate is online. Problem, there's a lot of bad information online as well as good information. So how do you separate the good from the bad? And that's one of the roles that the office can play, as well as directly providing weather and climate information in the form of those monthly weather summaries, for example. I'm still struck by how many people think the Farmer's Almanac is a reliable way to gauge what the weather is going to be this winter. <laughs> Where is John Martin's not here, because he already uh, was dissing the uh, uh, Farmer's Almanac last Friday night. I was happy to hear that. Anyway, it is not, and, uh, and uh, other sources are better, obviously, for this, this crowd. Interpretation is another I. So assisting users in how to understand and apply reliable information. So even if people find good information or we provide it, it's still not always easy to understand and apply. A lot of it's technical, as we know, and people can misuse it. Not necessarily intentionally, but just because they don't really understand all that went into it or all the caveats. 
station changes, location changes, and along the record and so forth. So this kind of consultant service is something, an important role that we can provide. And the last I is investigation, meaning research, both basic and applied. So basic, curiosity-driven research, so I'll describe in a moment, and then apply that's more tailored toward decision making. How can we provide tools that help Wisconsinites make better decisions uh, if weather and climate affects their operations? So that's, that's a big picture look at my vision and, and uh, idea for the mission of the office. And something that I want to distinguish right now is between our Wisconsin State Climatology Office on one hand and its partner organization, WIKI, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. Um, this has a much longer history of, uh, of activity in the last 15 years in terms of resources and, and getting the word out. Uh, this is a partnership between the Nelson Institute here on campus and the Wisconsin DNR. Um, I'm serving as one of the co-directors along with Ann Kipper in the DNR. And uh, we produced an assessment report of Wisconsin's changing climate last year, but one of the, the key differences, kind of a compare and contrast here, is that I see the office, the, the State Climatology Office, being much more focused on the past, how has climate changed since the 1800s, and the present. What about this summer's drought? What about this winter's El Nino? Uh, and so it's much more about near-term weather and climate. Whereas Wiki has a different purview, although it is interested in present climate impacts, it's, it has a strong eye toward the future, uh, and, and especially societal impacts. So questions like, you know, what are future with more heavy rainfall events? Are we gonna have to change our stormwater management procedures? Uh, with more heat waves, does, do public health officials need to change how they uh, prepare for summers, for example? So those sorts of questions are in the wiki domain, and the SCO is more about the past and the present. So the lines do blur at times, uh, but we try to separate those as much as possible and, and really have the SCO um, try not to, to go out of its lane and, and wiki as well, stay in our lanes. What do these resources allow the SCO to do? So I mentioned expanded staff already. I'm going to give some other examples. These monthly climate summaries. So this is something you can get online. We have them uh, back to January, um, both monthly and seasonal. So the, the August one is the most recent, and the September one is coming up shortly. Here's an example for April. It was a strange month, like a lot of the months this year have been, uh, in that it was, it was two Aprils. So we had, if you remember, it was a really warm beginning half of the month. And, uh, and then just as quickly it flipped to a really cold second half of the month. And we described this uh, in the report, give a, a map showing the accumulated precipitation anomalies, uh, uh, percentages of normal, so it was very wet, a lot of snow up north, and already by April, you can see the drought beginning to emerge in southern Wisconsin, so that was a sign of things to come. But again, these are written for the masses, um, but I think people here in this audience who have a good meteorology background would, would still appreciate them. They're not, they're not so general that you can't get something out of them, too. Something now that we're able to do, thanks to Dia uh, as our communications director, is we're trying an experiment here and uh, emailing this uh, so that it's a distilled version, more visual, more punchy, I guess, more bulleted. Um, uh, distilled version of these monthly climate summaries. People can get by email, get on your phone. Um, we, we did a trial run. You may have already received one of these in your inboxes. We hope you'll continue to, to subscribe. And um, that way you can get uh, these monthly updates very quick. Just read over your lunch hour and get an immediate update on things going on in the state. Social media. I had never tweeted until January, and yet now I'm, you know, on occasion I tweet when there's something relevant to talk about. And one of the things, for example, that I've been tweeting a lot about this year is the drought. And so when there's a, a drought update every Thursday, if it's relevant, I'll post something, for instance, mid September, statewide drought severity at a record magnitude, um, and then Unfortunately, it looked like it was going to be pretty dry the rest of that week, which it was until uh, 
about a week later, we finally started to turn the corner. Uh, but I see, you know, Twitter, mixed bag, right? I mean, uh, some people like it, some people think they don't like it, there's all sorts of uh, issues with uh, uh, the politics there, but I think that it is a helpful way to quickly get information out in an informal way and also get the, the office's name out. Uh, so that's been one of the reasons I've done that and Dia has been posting as well. It's been really gratifying to get a lot of traditional media coverage this year. And that, again, is with expanded capacity in the office, we're able to do it. And the, the weather this year has helped as well. Um, farming magazines here, Wisconsin State Farmer, uh, Successful Farming. This is exactly our target audience with this Rural Partnerships Institute grant. Uh, Wisconsin Public Radio, we've had some articles just talking about the fact that we now have new resources. So there's been some that are more weather focused and then others that are more um, just about the different uh, aspects of the office itself. Another one here, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in June, really good coverage, stuck without funding for years. Uh, the SCO is now open for business. And then others are more about, wow, it's been hot, smoky, and dry a lot of times this summer. And uh, this here and now story was a, a way to get the word out on TV. Uh, and then there's another one about the weather whiplash in the state or, or the WKOW. So it's been nice, different um, you know, podcasts, newspapers, TV, a lot of different ways to get the office's name out. And I've been really pleasantly surprised by how many reporters have been interested. Another thing we can do with money in the budget is to go to conferences and do more outreach. Here's a list of some of the activities in that capacity in 2023. One of the first things uh, in the year was an invitation <coughs> to the Country Visions Farm Cooperative up near Green Bay for their annual conference. The Midwestern Regional Climate Center, which is a, a close partner of the SCO, had a workshop, their annual workshop for Midwestern uh, State Climate Offices, followed shortly by the American Association of State Climatologists. This is a conference that John and Ed have been going to for years, and it's my first one, but it's a great way because now you get to meet and network with state climate offices and state climatologists and assistants from all over the country and get some really good ideas. Extension, uh, Badger Crop Connect, they have a webinar series to help farmers. Uh, this year they had a, a occasional special webinars on the drought, and so I provided climate uh, guidance and background on the drought through that. Just about to go to a Wisconsin Academy sponsored summit on agriculture and rural resilience up in Eau Claire. That'll be a great way to connect with over a hundred farmers and ag representatives up there. And then again extension in their Badger Crop Series putting on a road show in November. They do this every year going to different cities across the state and uh, have multiple um, farm organizations and farmers attending that. So Another good way to get the word out. Just got an invitation to the Wisconsin DNR Drinking Water and Groundwater Program uh, in Chula Vista, so that will be in December. A different audience, much more hydrology focused. And then for next year, already some things going on. The Wisconsin Potato and Vegetable Growers mm -hmm. Association, that's a biggie. Really happy to get an invitation to speak to them. Um, and then already lined up a Wisconsin Master Naturalist training through UW Extension next August. And then, this is not a typo, <laughs> this was for June of 2025, uh, the Arboret Arboretum Luncheon Lecture Series. So, I, so I'm quite sure I have nothing on the calendar for June of 2025. This is great. I mean, this is, this is wonderful. And as we get um, the, the full-time assistant, that, that'll be even more opportunities to expand uh, some of these invitations and accept more. Something you should definitely look at, if you haven't already, the brand new website. This was made possible by Eric Lister and Diane Stoyanovich in the Nelson Institute. They and Ed and I have had meetings since oh, probably early February uh, as we strategize to transform our website for many years into something that's newer, more functional, more modern. Um, it's better if you have a phone and you're looking at it that way. It's um, Featuring here some of our areas of expertise. Climate data is going to be the bread and butter component, probably always on our website when people come to visit, but also now the expanded mesonet, as I'll get to. And then uh, right now it's more uh, examples of 
preliminary research we've done and, and research we may do. But just as an example, if you go down and you click on some of those links, like recent data, historic data, uh, you can bring up stuff like this, which is a, a new format. If you want to get climate normals for any location in Wisconsin, these are a combination of co-op and airport stations, and you just go and click, you click on Madison's, you'll end up getting a graph like this. It's automatically generated <coughs> the most recent 30-year climate normals, so the, the daily average high for a month, the average low and the mean, precipitation in green, and monthly snowfall. And if you hover the cursor over uh, any of these, you actually can see the, the exact values. You can then print or download the graphic or the table that accompanies it. And so you really are, it's great if you have presentations, you just want to quickly get that and, and run with it. Another thing you can do from uh, the new website is get the daily highs and lows for every day of the year compared to normal. So this is the, the yellow line is the average annual uh, daily maximum, blue is daily minimum starting in January through today. And so you can pick up things for 2023 like that really warm early April we had or the late season heat wave. Uh, or the fact that we didn't have much bitterly cold air at all. We had only like two or three nights below zero in 2023. The big story this year, though, of course, has been the precipitation. So this is a new way of looking at it, um, but I, it's a lot here on one graph. So the, the blue bars are the precipitation amounts for a given day for here. And then the, the black line is the accumulated running average for the year. And the green is the normal. So just from that, you can see that in the early part of the year, the actual exceeded the normal, accumulated, and then when the drought hit, we stayed below ever since. And then as uh, bookends, this is the highest, wettest year on record, and the red is the lowest, driest year on record. So a lot of stuff you can get out of this, and we've tried to make it so that any of these graphs you can download, either the, the data or the, the graphic itself. Those are individual stations. If you want a big statewide perspective for climate trends, you can see those illustrated really well. Uh, going back to 1895 from NCEI, average statewide temperature, and boy, you really see the last 25 years how unusually warm we've been. And similarly for precipitation, the statewide average 20 teens being so wet stands out really clearly here. Compare that to the 1930s dry dust bowl. So in, in very quickly, you can get this information. If we've tried to automate this so much, as much as possible, so Ed doesn't have to do manual updates of graphs so often. I know he enjoys it, but it's a lot of work. Um, this way, we're, we're trying to make it as seamless as possible. OK, so that's some of the new offerings. I was going to do a demo, but in the interest of time, I'll skip that. Um, but one of the other things that we're going to be promoting more on the website and in our own research is this Wisconsin Environmental um, Mesonet. So this is the, a project as part of the Rural Partnerships Institute that Chris Kacharik and Chris Bogaski have been heading up. And um, it's very uh, oriented toward improving decision making. And let me just give you in a nutshell some of the highlights here. So one of the great things about it is that there's going to be one weather station at least in every Wisconsin county all 72, and then some will have more than that with a goal of 90 stations across the state. And it's not just weather information, but there's soil temperature and moisture, that's, and it's all updated every five minutes. Really great information, great database. And the variables that it'll provide, and already are providing, temperature, relative humidity, precipitation, wind, solar energy, snow depth, and then soil conditions, both temperature and moisture, at five depths down to one meter, which is surprising. I mean, that's better than a lot of mesonets I've seen. So here is the current map of these mesonet stations. 17 up, 73 to go. You see that they're not evenly distributed yet. Door County uh, has a bunch to help its uh, cherry and apple growers. Uh, several now around Madison. There are some gaps, but they're, Chris and Chris are very well aware of it, and they're going to be strategic about where they place these coming up. There's going to be several more coming up uh, still by the end of this calendar year. 
And just to show you some of the utility of this mesonet data, if you pick one of these, and I just picked as an example Hancock, in the center part of the state, and you look at its soil moisture data, say for 20 inch depth, starting in April 1st, so I picked that when we were still wet, and then going to the present. And it's really, it gives you a nice illustration of our drought. For the first few weeks, even the first month or two, the soil moisture was, was plentiful, and then look at how it just dropped out. Uh, in May into June, and then the peak drought you can infer in July, and then we had a couple of big rain events sandwiched between dry spells, so you can see how the soil dried out, and, um, and so we're still not great, but we're a lot better off than we were in July. One of the reasons this is useful, it's not just a reality check, because we all knew it was dry in May, June, and July around here, but when you put together the drought monitor, it's so important to have consistent data across the state. The drought authors and the advisors like me rely on a lot of piecemeal information. So precipitation amounts in different parts of the state, condition monitoring reports by observers, those are qualitative, they're not consistent from one observer to another. Something like the WISCO net, the mesonet, provides consistent ways of measuring things like soil moisture. Uh, when precipitation, but especially soil moisture that's hard to find elsewhere, so that the Hancock station is compatible with one of the Door County stations, and an Eau Claire station, and a Madison station. So then when you look at the data, you can say, okay, yeah, so Dane County is a certain dryness, uh, up by Hancock is a different dryness, and you know it's not just an observer bias, for example. So this is going to be a terrific resource, especially as we get you know, a future drought, uh, but just even in its own right. The Mesonet's not the only observing system in town. Uh, there's also this Coco Ross Community Collaborative <coughs> Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. It's a mouthful, uh, but this is something that if you're interested, I don't know, is anybody a Coco Ross observer here? Okay, got a few. Yeah, I started this year. It's kind of a fun way. You get a rain gauge, a uh, standardized rain gauge, and you upload your reports every day, um, and then you can see on a small scale how these rainfall or snowfall measurements vary. And especially during a drought, when you have sometimes in the summer big variations spatially, it's really helpful for drought authors in particular to see how these differences um, uh, have lined up in a certain county and help mark the drought monitor map more accurately. The office is one of the coordinators, along with the National Weather Service and Sullivan. And so uh, that's another reason I'm encouraging you to do it, but it's just, uh, it really is a, a useful database for um, understanding moisture and, and weather conditions. Research, this is something that uh, was beyond the capacity for the most part of John and Ed when they were doing this on a volunteer basis, but now we have the ability to, to provide more research to understand Wisconsin's climate better and also to provide some helpful decision support tools. So basic research, curiosity driven. Is Wisconsin getting snowier? Such a basic question. Well, it's not a simple answer. We have snowfall records dating back to the 1890s. And this is the seasonal snowfall amount to the present. It doesn't quite include the snowy winter we just had. If you take this data literally, you would say we are becoming snowier by a lot, a foot more on average than in the early 1890s. But there's a real question about whether this is real or spurious. And we've, some of us have lived through some of these snowy winters recently, so we can believe it. But even though, even then, we don't know how they compare to some of the winters in the, the distant past when we weren't around. The reason it's a question is that there's different ways that snow is measured now than there was 100 years ago. The timing is different, the snow platforms, how quickly or how, how uh, often the platform is, is um, cleared, snow to rainfall ratios, various things. Ken Kunkel had a nice article about this years ago. And uh, so this is the kind of question that a state climate office can explore and try to help resolve. Another one, which is uh, just keeps puzzling me continuously is why aren't we getting more extreme heat in Wisconsin? There's no doubt the climate's warming. There's no doubt Wisconsin's climate warming. 
Our summers are warming, and yet, if you look at measures of hot days, frequencies of hot days, or intensity, uh, we don't see the, the signal as clearly as you would expect. This is the highest statewide temperature in any calendar year, going back all the way to 1885. And here's the 100 degree baseline, and you see that it was commonplace most years in the first half of the record. Wisconsin exceeded 100 degrees, and you see the big spike in the 1930s. But yet, we went through this period, oddly, we went through 10 years without breaking 100 degrees. We just broke it during that late August heat wave this year. It's the first time since 2012 that any station in Wisconsin had broken 100 degrees. Really odd. There hadn't been anything that cool in the record. So how do you resolve that? Why, why are the summers getting warmer, but the extreme heat during summer is not? Not sure. Some people say it's corn sweat coming from more agricultural intensity. Um, uh, maybe. Maybe there's another factor. Maybe there's measurement differences. We don't know. But that's another kind of basic research question that a state climatology office can explore. And then some final examples here are more practical. This is applied research. South Dakota Climate Office, through funding uh, by way of their Soybean Council, got a grant to implement a spray forecast tool. They have an online portal that, using mesonet data from South Dakota, they instantly um, give information on wind speed and temperature inversion to tell farmers whether it's safe to spray for their soybeans. And it's all color-coded. Red means no, nope, don't spray. In this case, it's too windy. Green means, yeah, you're okay to spray, and yellow means not sure, okay, be cautious. And so this is a very practical thing for soybean growers to know when it's safe to spray. Wisconsin already has uh, something similar. It's something called a runoff risk advisory forecast to help with manure management decisions. <coughs> this is something through DATCAP, which uh, has a map updated each day, and depending on the state of the soil, frozen or thawed, uh, soil moisture conditions and rainfall, it produces a, um, an advisory uh, forecast. So anything in magenta here is bad, don't, don't spray. In this case, it was probably too, the ground was too snowy or frozen, uh, but yellow means uh, the risk is low, so that it was warm enough that the soils could handle it. Another practical kind of tool for decision makers. The Kansas Climate Office has come up with an animal comfort index which is based on the wet bulb globe temperature, and so they, they use temperature, uh, temperature, humidity, sunlight, and wind speed, uh, and update this from their mesonet climate data every hour. And based on that, they also come up with this color coding. If it's above a certain threshold, that index means watch out. If you have livestock, be extra careful. Uh, it works in the summer, and it works in the winter uh, based on wind chill tell farmers when they're in real danger with their livestock. And then one other idea that hasn't really germinated yet, but I think it's possible that we could do something like this in Wisconsin. We all know maple, the, the flow of maple sap is highly dependent on temperature. There was a study done recently that showed quantitatively, looking at a lot of different um, uh, measurements, different places around the, the eastern U.S., they found that there was a, an optimal maximum daily high and minimum daily low that was best for sap flow. So it's color-coded here. The reds indicate the optimal conditions. It's no secret. Days above freezing, nights below freezing, good for flow. But they quantified it. It looks like optimally somewhere around 50 degree highs and around low to mid-20s for lows is optimal. And so having something like this uh, based on National Weather Service temperature forecast for the next week or two, uh, this could be a kind of tool to help um, those people who, who do maple syrup uh, production, and Wisconsin's actually a big maple syrup producer, uh, to provide quantitative information to help their guidance. All right, so the last thing I'm going to show here is our partners and collaborators. And uh, at the top, uh, Rural Partnerships Institute that made this possible, we're housed in the Center for Climatic Research, uh, part of, which is part of the Nelson Institute, and, and they also provided a lot of extra funding, in-kind, and uh, actual support for the office. And then you see a lot of different 
organizations, some internal to campus, some internal to this building, uh, and some external. Uh, but what we'd really like is to expand these logos and really pack the page with more partnerships and collaborations because that'll be a sign that the office is relevant and is really meeting our mission. To wrap up, we're here to serve the three I's, providing information, interpretation, and investigation. Those, those are the climate services. Lots of new offerings, the new website, social media, more staff, monthly summaries. The research part is forthcoming. Uh, we have things that have been developed partially or not published yet, but uh, with a full staff, I think we can really provide some interesting research products. Our goal, in part, is to become the go-to resource for weather and climate. So when we have a bad drought, when we have these weather whiplash episodes, we sure like folks to come to our office instead of uh, bothering people who may not be as qualified or people who are very qualified but have so much other stuff on their plate. Why not come to an office whose mission is climate services? And then I'll make the point again, climate offices are needed now more than ever as our climate rapidly changes. And also a pitch, we're currently only on a four-year grant, and so we need to find some way to provide sustainable funding to keep this office going in the long term. I'll stop there and be happy to take questions or comments. Thank you very much, Steve. That was a really nice update and a, and a look forward. Um, I'll let you choose who you want to answer questions. Well, from. I'll pick Stefan because he's the only one with his hand up. I remember a long time back, um, it was the Wisconsin Climate Energy Office. It was actually federally funded and organized. And then there came some president who changed that and cut it off. So, no. Who was the president? <laughs> I don't know. It predates me, but it was in, it was 1973. Something so, like that. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, the economy wasn't great in 1973. That was probably one factor. But I don't know. I don't really know the history of why the feds decided to create the state climatology program in the 50s. I can imagine why it was discontinued because <laughs> of budget problems. But the impetus, it was Helmut Landsberg, apparently, who made the push to get mm -hmm. this uh, going in the 1950s. John's nodding his head. Do you know more about the history about how that in the, oh, the politicians killed it. They, they decided that uh, states should not be using federal funds yeah, yeah, yeah. to um, support a state uh, service. Mm -hmm. And so I think Nixon had a lot to do with it. Nixon. Mm -hmm. and, but do you know how it formed in the 50s? What was the impetus to get it uh, created? Helmut Landsberg. He mm -hmm. just had a lot of sway? Yeah, he was uh, late in his career. He was. Uh, professor at the University of Maryland, like, at, in, this was in the 50s. Mm -hmm. okay. so this is a period when everything meteorological was starting to develop after World War II. And there were a lot of uh, people that were younger who were uh, making weather service develop and, and universities develop, etc. Mm -hmm. Same with climate. Okay. But that one didn't stick, the federal funding, because of politicians. Right. Okay, so we'll blame politicians. Yeah, that's what I remember. It was a political sort of a yeah. muzzled in there. Yeah. Right? So this is all really exciting and congratulations on being able to kick it off. In for most state climate offices, are they funded by universities or are they funded separately by the state. Yeah, it's What's a good question. How are state climate offices funded? It's all over the place. Yeah. The funding and the, the administrative locations, the Iowa office, for example, is in the Department of Agriculture. Okay. So that's great in the sense that they have guaranteed funding, but it's not so great that they have to be beholden to the, the right. political interests. Illinois is in the state water survey. Uh, Indiana's Purdue and the Midwestern Regional Climate Center. Michigan is at Michigan State University. Minnesota is in their DNR. So just our neighboring states, there's a whole range of, of different funding options and locations. So that, there's a lot of different models, and maybe there's some models that cobble together funding from a group of sources. That's another potential. The university's talking about focusing on climate change and sustainability. It seems like there's an opportunity. Absolutely. I, mean, I hope so. Yeah. So 
Who is good on the team? Uh, hello. Okay, Chris. Chris, David, Caitlin. Uh, All right, the whole team. We're running, running with Snownet. Uh, I don't want to disappoint everybody, but no snow depth. No snow depth. Mm -hmm. No okay. snow depth. Uh, so, but uh, Coco Ross does snow depth. So you Coco Ross does will do snow depth, but uh, but not with snow depth. Uh, but you know, we are here. We live over in Wisconsin Energy Institute. Uh, so if you ever need to, to come see us, that's where that's where we are. Uh, three more weather stations will go in next week. Caitlin and I will get out. And Get those in, uh, and we've talked about and I've got David keyed on putting the cattle comfort index on. All good. Yeah. So that would be something we could put on the as a um, yeah. So any tool that you have, we can advertise or vice versa. So we can work in tandem. That's great. Thanks for that. And, and how many do you expect to get up before the end of the year? Uh, so we'll be at 20 by the end of this year, um, and then 20 to 25 more next year. Year after. Great. Go from there. Thanks for the update. Terrific. And Ruja and then Evan. We can go for a second. Talk to you. Okay. Um, so the the increased like online presence is awesome, and all the conference attendance that you're planning sounds really cool too. I was wondering if you have plans to like actively go out into rural communities because I feel like a lot of those conference type things, you might not get people who are just like in small communities who might find this stuff really useful but might never hear about it. So do you have any plans to like go out yeah, and do it? Yep, yep. So one of the things is that, um, I won't go back all the way, but this um, Agricultural and Rural Resilience Summit, um, mm -hmm. so that is targeting, I, I'm not the organizer, but they are targeting you know, individual farmers and, and farm organizations and so on. <coughs> kind of casual, full day summit. Lots of time to, to network and interact. The roadshow that I mentioned that Extension's doing, um, going to be going to, oh, where do they accept? Um, I remember now, South Darlington. No, anyway, Southwest Wisconsin. Uh, I'll be going there in late November, and that's another opportunity to, to meet with farmers directly. Another opportunity is the Rural Partnerships Institute's um, research and outreach grant. So uh, we're going to be having a group meeting today, in fact. There's four funded right now. And they cover different aspects of rural resilience, rural economy, rural health. There's one in particular I think there might be a, a hook for us, and that is food system resilience. Um, and they're emphasizing uh, maple syrup, syrup, for example. They're emphasizing tribal involvement. So I think that that's of the four, that would be a possibility, and that would be another way to really go directly. But I completely agree, and, and that farm um, uh, Country Visions Cooperative was another example. I was, you know, having dinner and, and interacting with about 100 farmers around Northeast Wisconsin. So I'm looking for more opportunities for that. Um, but people haven't been knocking down our door to do it yet. And, and I'm told in part that's because it's the growing season. Um, wait until November, December, and those things will, will arrive. But yeah, I, I completely agree. That's that's important. Let's see, Bridget. Yeah, I just had a. Like a stupid question about like I just re I recently learned that Wisconsin is also a big cranberry uh, supplier thing. Have you like received any questions from the cranberry farmers? Because I don't think if they're super concentrated on the Door County or not, and whether the changing climate affects the cranberry growth, and they might be interested as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's the cran the cranberry growers was one target. Um, the the potato and vegetable growers was another one. Uh, so I was glad to, to get in with their conference. But yeah, cranberry growers are big and they're powerful. And so it'd be nice, just like the dairy industry, right? Yeah. So, you know, you have to uh, accept reality and, and those are the big players. So if we really want to have an impact on not just rural Wisconsin, but farming in particular, those are the, the organizations to really connect with. So we're putting on a Wisconsin station at the Cranberry Research Station. So. Um, well, there you go. Very nice. Yep. So, as part of the rural partnerships, there's also recreation. And I know, particularly northern Wisconsin, is really concerned about climate change and the, the you know, warmer, wetter winter and loss of a whole recreational industry. Mm -hmm. Have you reached out to any of them as well? 
indirectly, Wiki has its own tourism and outdoor recreation okay. working group, okay. and through them, uh, and especially in terms of climate change, and this is where the, the lines get blurred, yeah, because so. obviously right. future, but present, you know, how has the drought affected tourism, you know? And, and how did the wet winter with all the snow affect tourism? It's great for snowmobiling and skiing up north, for example. So that is where the, the present um, right. is both the SCO and Wiki. So yeah, that's an important one too. Big, big business. Wayne, did you have something like that? Not much. I was getting the same uh, questions about the DNR and resource management, forestry, uh -huh. um, I think in the Great Lakes management fisheries. Um, there's a lot of useful information even beyond just agriculture, if you take it down that side of it, but being from Central Wisconsin, born and raised here in Central Wisconsin, um, and being also in like a school in Northern Wisconsin, I can totally see so many different areas, each of the going over these four years and make it stick. Because that's, that's going to be the issue is dollars after yep. the fourth year, right? Yep. Um, and I, I'm glad that you brought up these funding models because I know, uh, well, Pam now, she probably talked to her in Georgia. She, State climatologist up here voluntarily for a while. Maybe she would be part time, I'm not sure. Yeah, she was. But Georgia has it has its own model in the South. So I think going to some of these conferences and seeing these other funding models might help a lot, but it is state specific. Yeah, it's very state specific. Uh, Kentucky's gotten a big influx of money for their state climatology office. Um, you mentioned Georgia. North Carolina has a booming office. Um, others are just kind of one person shows and they they don't have a lot. So it, it, it's all over the place. But yeah, you're right, getting ideas from them about what works and who to talk to and how to make this work. The other thing too, is like, as I said, we're separating the SEO from Wiki, but one of the advantages of Wiki is the DNR is one of the, the foundations of Wiki. And Ann Kipper, my counterpart, uh, co-director in Wiki, is, is in the DNR. And, and uh, she and I and uh, Sean Kennedy, a new uh, DNR policy, kind of policy advisor, will be meeting in a couple <coughs> weeks to strategize and brainstorm how can we get state support thinking ahead long term for the SCO and so having them as allies is a huge benefit for the office. They know that state political scene a lot better than they do. Anything else? All right, thanks for your attention. All right, let's thank Steve one more time.